All right, everybody, we are back with investigation section seven, and we have a ton to talk about in this section. So let's go ahead and get started. Uh, here is our funny internet picture of the day. And you know, the best part about this is I bet the kid was really happy for the, uh, the increased views. You know what I mean? Um, but if you're ever in one of my classes and, and you want to stream for that day, we will totally support you. We support those with the stream dream. All right. So first off, we got to uh, find our suspects. So step one is to develop a suspect to go from, we have no idea who did it to, okay, we think we might know who did it, right? Um, there's lots of different ways to do this. Lots of different tools we can use. Lots of different uh, methods we can use. Um, here is just a partial list of that. Uh, so we can start with a witness description. If there was a witness who saw the crime, um, most commonly being obviously the victim, uh, assuming the victim's not dead, um, the victim can, can describe to you what the offender looked like. Rough age, rough height, race, gender, all those things um, are things that uh, uh, witnesses can provide. But keep in mind, they're not always correct. And it's not that they're lying. It's not that they're telling you the wrong thing. It's just that they're wrong. So personally, I'm really, really exceedingly tall. Um, so I'm a terrible judge of height. Um, like, uh, I remember uh, one day I asked my mom, I said, mom, how tall are you? Like, like five, one, five, two. And she was like, Kevin, I'm five, six. So I was way off. And this was someone I had known for, you know, 30 plus years at that point. Um, so witness descriptions don't take them as exact, just as in kind of estimation. Um, vehicle descriptions, same thing. Was it dark color or light color? White, green, blue, or red? Was it a car or a pickup truck or an SUV? Um, hopefully they got a partial license plate. Maybe even the state of the, of the, um, of the license plate can help a lot. Um, but, you know, and they just got a couple letters, the first two or three letters, uh, combined with the state and the, the kind of car. So if they say, you know, it was a, 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 a white Prius with Tennessee plates that begin with XY, that can be enough to narrow it down to only five or six cars in the state of Tennessee that match that description that begins with those letters. Um, so even those partial license plate clues can be a big deal. Um, luckily, we live in the 21st century where everybody's got a camera in their pocket and it's lovely and wonderful. Um, so lots and lots and lots of people uh, will have their cell phones out and be able to get at least pictures, if not full video. And that can be a great help in figuring out who was it that committed that crime. Um, even information from either witnesses or other people who are aware of who has the motive or the opportunity to commit the crime. So if a store gets robbed overnight, but there's no evidence of a forced break-in, the owner of that store is going to be able to tell you exactly who has the opportunity to do that, i.e. who else has the key to the building. Because um, if there was no forced break-in, somebody probably used a key, so it's probably one of them that did it. Uh, information on MO. So if there's a, a person who commits crimes in a relatively unique way, uh, maybe they use a, a substance or a tool that's not very common, um, something like that. If you have a database or even just your personal memory or fellow investigators, personal memory, you know, you come to, you go around and you say, man, there's this case with this really weird, you know, the guy used uh, liquid nitrogen to freeze the locks before breaking them open. That's a relatively unusual thing. And if some other investigators like, oh yeah, we had a case like five years ago where that same MO was used. That's a good place to start to develop suspects. Um, you can get composite drawings. If you have even one witness or multiple witnesses do uh, uh, composite drawings, pictures like this one uh, pictured above, um, that can help you find the suspect. Um, a psychological profile. <sighs> There's been kind of conflicting reports about how well these work. Um, there was a famous case back in the 30s, 40s, 50s with the Con Edison bomber. Um but uh, where, where they, they used a psychological profile to predict and kind of narrow down the suspect pool and the profile ended up being very, very accurate. Uh, but then there are times when psychological profiles are 
not accurate at all when they eventually find the person. So um, it, they can help, um, but they're not as good as modern television likes to make you think. Um, and then there's geographic profiles. So people tend to commit crime in certain patterns and certain ways, depending on where they live and where they work and um, uh, their socioeconomic status and their race and their, you know, all these things dictate where we go and what we do um, with our daily lives. And that also applies to criminals. So if we know when and where crimes are happening and enough of them happen that we're pretty sure are from the same person, we can put them together and create a, a geographic profile of where they probably live and or work or and or spend their time. Come on, next page. There we go, okay. Um, racial profiling, is a lot of people think racial profiling is useful, um, but um, it's not as useful as its proponents make it out. And it's gotten to the point where um, they, many in politics and the media and law enforcement want to racially profile but they know they can't use the, they know they can't ask to racially profile or tell people to racially profile on purpose. So they use dog whistle terms, i.e. terms that are ostensibly or on the surface perfectly um, nondescript or perfectly uh, non-racially motivated, um, but those who know what they're listening for can identify what you really mean. So, um, you know, when a politician says we need to go after urban thugs, that's a dog whistle, meaning we should go after young black males. Um, so it is very easy and um, the police in the United States and in other countries are very... It's a very difficult process to not racially profile sometimes, especially when there are that kind of these, these dog whistle terms that they can use to try to justify it. Um, obviously, African Americans in the United States are, are a group that is racially profiled a lot. Um, after 9-11, there was a huge spike in the racially, racial profiling of uh, people of Middle Eastern descent. Um, one of the real large downsides of America's reaction to 9-11, we like to talk about how we came together and everybody, you know, there was no Republicans and no Democrats. We all came together and we were just Americans unless you were Middle Eastern. Um, and you didn't even have to be a Muslim. There are reports from all over the country of Sikhs who wear turbans, um, are, tend to be Middle Eastern looking, um, of them getting uh, uh, abused and, you know, um, uh, assaulted, arrested by police, um, assaulted by non-police uh, because they were Muslim looking or they looked like a terrorist just because of their skin color and the fact that they wore a turban. So race is an ever present issue especially in the United States, but also in lots of other places in the world. Um, there are a few relevant um, uh, 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 Supreme Court cases here, 1992 U.S. v. Weaver. And basically what the, the a police officer knew, I believe it was out of Kansas City, um, and a police officer in an airport knew that young black males were transporting large amounts of drugs from Los Angeles to Kansas City. So a plane was debarking um, from Los Angeles at the Kansas City airport. He observed a young black male um, with uh, um, uh, a large amount of luggage and um, a uh, used that as reasonable suspicion to stop that male and uh, do a search. And sure enough, found drugs. And the Supreme Court said that um, 
using race as part of a larger description of uh, kind of known uh, profile of, of drug smugglers or drug dealers um, was perfectly okay. So race can be legally one of a number of factors that can provide police reasonable suspicion if there is some factual basis to place that uh, uh, racial, how do I explain this? Because this officer had specific intelligence that it was young African-American males doing the smuggling, he was able to use that as part, not the all, but part of the reason to make the stop of that particular young black male. If he just had a general, people are smuggling drugs into Kansas City, and there was no specific information about the race of those people, and he used African American as a, 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 a one reason among many to commit that stop, that wouldn't have been okay. But since he specifically knew that the person who was smuggling these drugs or the group that was smuggling these drugs were African Americans, he was able to use that as part of the reasonable suspicion to stop that particular African American. Um, another case, 1996, Ren v. U.S. Um, in this case, um, police were using what are called pretext stops. So the police see a car that they want to stop for some reason. The reason they want to stop it isn't legally enough to actually stop it. So they s follow the car until they the person driving the car does something, rolls through a stop sign, runs red light, speeds a little bit, something that is enough legally to pull them over. And they pull them over and are able to not only investigate them for the actual reason they pulled them over, but the, the pretext reason as well. Um, and the Supreme Court in this 96 case said, that's perfectly all right. That's perfectly constitutional as well. So race is definitely a, an issue. Um, it also comes in with witness identification. Cross-racial witness identifications, which we talked about a couple slides ago, are notoriously terrible. Um, so one, a person of one race trying to identify a person of another race as, yes, that's the person who did it, or no, that's not the person who did it, notoriously just terrible. Um, once we, we have a person uh, uh, as a suspect and we want to identify who they are, um, the easiest way to do that is obviously like a driver's license or a state-issued ID card. Um, unfortunately, these historically have been relatively easy to fake. Um, the 9-11 terrorists, there were 19 of them, and between those 19 people, they had 63 uh, uh, driver's licenses and identification cards. So because of this, after 9-11, um, the U.S. government passed a law called the Real ID Act, which says that all driver's licenses among all the 50 states have to have these certain features that make them harder to fake, um, easier for police officers to uh, use and, and know they're real. Um, so one of the things you can look at in your eye, it, it still hasn't, not all 50 states have implemented all these changes yet. Um, but one of the things you can do if you have a, a U.S. driver's license or ID card is look on it. And if it has this, this gold star on it, as you can see above, right there, if it has that gold star, your state has implemented the full real ID um, requirements. But as of time of this recording, I don't believe all 50 states have done it. Uh, currently, I'm residing in Tennessee, and they have done it. Um, I formerly lived in Georgia. I know they did it. Um, but you can look at your driver's license or ID card and see if there's that gold star on it. Another good way to uh, check the identification of a certain suspect and you know, or you know, somebody you've arrested, you want to see exactly who they are. They don't have a driver's license that won't tell you their name, is biometrics. And biometrics is just a fancy word for measurements of the body or some piece of the body that are um, either unique to one person or close enough to unique to one person. Uh, so, you know, even if the odds of someone having the exact same 
fingerprints as me, if theoretically, let's say there were one in a billion, that still means there are roughly seven people on the planet that share that exact same fingerprint. But at the same time, that's close enough, right? Statistically, so if we can match this fingerprint to one in a billion, that's close enough. We're going to, we're going to call that, you know, uh, uh, 100% identification, but there's fingerprints, which lots of people know your fingers, you know, the, the tips of them, everything you touch leaves a little oil print on it. Um, and those can be matched close enough to individuals, uh, retinas. The retina is, um, the back of your eyeball. So if you look through the pupil, which is the black part of your eye, if you shine a light back there. You can see on the back of your eyeball, there's a certain pattern of little dots and blood vessels and rods and cones and stuff. And those patterns are unique to the individual. So, uh, you know, in movies and stuff where they shine a light inside your eye uh, in order to identify you, uh, usually if it's going inside the eye, that's a retina scan. The other kind of eye scan is your iris scan. The iris is the part of your eye that has the color. So my irises are, are blue. If you can kind of see that, I don't know how well that's going to come out on my cheap little webcam. Um, other people's eyes are brown or hazel or whatever. Um, but the part that has the color, if you look real close, there's a pattern in that, in that colored part of your eye. And that pattern uh, can be brought down to the individual level, just like fingerprints and the retina. And then, of course, there's facial recognition, right? Just the shape and size of your face. They do a whole bunch of different measurements based on your face. Uh, you know, the distance between your two pupils, uh, the distance between the tip of the nose and the, and the um, corners of the mouth, and, you know, all these tons and tons of measurements. And the pattern that results after all those measurements is supposedly as unique as fingerprints or retina scans or whatever. Um, facial recognition is showing a lot of promise, but it's still fairly clunky. Um, the best thing to do is to do what's called a one-to-one -one match, which means we think this is John Doe. We've got a picture of the actual John Doe and we've got a picture of our suspect that we think is John Doe. Is that the same person? With that kind of match, it's facial recognition is really good. What's difficult for facial recognition is the one-to-many where it's, you know, we're looking for one person we think he might be at a football game, so we're just going to scan the crowd at the football game and see if anybody in the crowd is this guy we're looking for. That's a, that kind of one-to-many search facial recognition isn't quite as good at. Um, it's possible it can be used to at least narrow down the suspect pool, um, but it's still difficult. And because of that, all the different types of biometrics need human converse, confirmation. You can't just trust a computer to say... Yes, this is the fingerprint of Bob Smith. You need to be able to have a human confirm that. Get Bob Smith's known fingerprint and the fingerprint of your suspect who you think is Bob Smith and compare them. Same with the, you know, all the other things. You need human confirmation. So let's say um, there's a uh, crime happens. Uh, very soon afterwards, within a few minutes, police arrest a suspect. They want to get a... Um, a confirmation that this is the person who did it. So one of the things they can do is what's called a field identification or more commonly it's called a show up where they arrest the person, put them in the back of the patrol car, take them back to the scene of the crime. Usually they'll pull them out of the patrol car and shine a light in their face so they can't see out, but other people can see in towards the suspect. Um, and they'll ask the witness to come out and identify, is that the person who robbed your store? Is that the person who assaulted you or whatever? Um, and that kind of one-to-one, -one, just is this the right person, can be done very soon after a crime. It has to be, you know, 15 to 20 minutes. Some lawyers will say, well, uh, you know, up to two hours is probably good enough. Um, but interestingly... This case, U.S. v. Ash from 1973, says that if you're going to be put into one of these show-ups as a suspect and uh, the police are going to ask the witness to identify whether you're the person that committed the crime or not, in that process, you do not have a right to counsel because they're not asking you to do anything except just kind of stand there. 
Um, so you don't have the right to counsel at one of these directly after the crime uh, showing you that to the witness, is this them or not? A little bit after, you know, let's say it's the next day or a few days later, a few weeks later, a few months later, whatever, um, and uh, uh, the police arrest a suspect, they think that's the person who committed the crime, they want the witness to help confirm it, they can do one of the options they have is what's called a mugshot lineup. So we all know when we're booked into prison, we all get our mugshot taken. Um, what police can do is take the mugshot of the suspect uh, that they've arrested for the crime and put it on a you know a piece of paper, put it on there, and then choose four, five, six other people that generally match the suspect's demographic. So roughly the same age, roughly the same age, height, race, height, weight, etc., and put those around. Uh, uh, you know, in kind of a random order on a mugshot page and then show that to the to the witness and say, which one of, you know, do you see the person here who committed the crime? And if they can immediately pick out the suspect's mugshot as, yeah, that's, that's the guy who did it, that's a positive identification. If they're like, eh, I really don't know, then you don't have that positive witness identification, which is a setback, but not necessarily... Um, uh, the end of the case. You can also do a very, very similar thing to that mug shop lineup, mug shot lineup, but do it in person. Famous scene in a movie called uh, The Usual Suspects here, which is absolutely great movie, very rated R, um, but if you like rated R movies, Usual Suspects is classic. Um, but basically, you do the same thing where you get, you know, five, six people that match the suspects, roughly the same age, height, etc. And you put them in a room, just like you see in the picture above, um, and each one can hold a number. So, you know, the person on the far right will hold a giant card with a one, second one, you know, card with a two, third one, card with a three. Um, and you can have them do an action or say a line or something, as long as all of them do it the exact same way. So, if the victim heard the uh, the person say, give me all your money, you can have each one of the five or six or however many people in the lineup step forward. You know, so number one, step forward. Number one, step forward. Say, give me all your money. Number one says, give me all your money. Okay, thank you. Number two, step forward. Number two, step forward. Number two, say, give me all your money. Give me all your money. So in that way, we can help the witness um, kind of... Uh, uh, have that additional stimulus of, you know, I don't really recognize his face, but I would remember his voice. And that, you know, so it, you can kind of generate those things as long as all of the people in the lineup are doing the exact same thing. Um, uh, that's perfectly fine. Um, these should be done double blind in that the, um, the, police officer who's actually running the lineup with the witness, the police officer with the witness who's saying, okay, do any of those guys look like the suspect who committed the crime against you? That police officer talking to the witness should not know which one of the six is the actual suspect and which are the other five that we just got because they look like the suspect. In that way, the officer can be guaranteed not to lead the witness on. Like, you know, are you sure it's not number two? So if the officer, you know, leading the witness through the process knows who the actual suspect is out of the group, they might do things either consciously or subconsciously that kind of guide the witness towards choosing the right one. Um, there's also the right to... Uh, 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 it's also proper or, or um, smart to record the entire thing just in case there's some later um, accusation of impropriety at the trial. Uh, you can say, well, we, have, we know exactly what happened at this lineup because we have the entire thing recorded. Um, so there's no question about what you did or didn't do or said or didn't say or whether there was anything unfair or whatever that happened. Um, so in 1966, there was a, a, a famous case Schmerber v. California, where um, 
essentially what the Supreme Court said in this case is that, sure, if a suspect does not want to participate in a lineup, you absolutely have the right to refuse that. But the prosecution can use that against you in court. In other words, they can tell the jury the defendant was so scared of being identified by this witness that he refused to participate in the lineup. And the jury can use that to kind of um, determine guilt or not. Um, you also have the right to counsel during a lineup. So if police are, are asking you to participate in a lineup, uh, you have the right to say, well, I want my lawyer there. And they essentially have to say yes. So, surveillance. This is kind of the second big subject of our section here today. Surveillance. There are at least two people in the process of surveillance. There's the surveillant, which is the investigator. And this can be one, it can be two, it can be a whole team of 10 or 15, you know, but at least one. Usually or almost always they're in plain clothes so as not to uh, tip off the, the other person, the person they are surveilling, uh, who is known as the subject. Um, and again, a lot of times they'll work in teams, but occasionally it'll be just the one person doing the surveillance. There's two different kinds of surveillance. There's stationary surveillance, which is also called a stakeout, which was also a classic movie starring Richard Dreyfuss and Emilio Estevez. Again, rated R, but if you like rated R movies, classic. Um, and you need, if you're doing a stationary surveillance, you need signals so you can communicate to other people or the rest of your team or whoever without kind of being obvious. So you don't wanna like, you know, if I'm conducting a stakeout and I'm operating a hot dog booth on the streets of New York while I'm keeping an eye on the front of a building, I don't want to have a big radio that I have to pull out and say, you know, all clear, nothing going on here. I need to be able to kind of do a hand signal that says either nothing happened in the last hour or, oh my God, I kind of see the, the suspect. Uh, he's coming out of the building now. Take his picture or follow him or arrest him or whatever. Just work out some kind of system of signals so that the people on the stakeout and the people that can arrest the person or are supposed to take the pictures or whatever the purpose of the stakeout is, can do the things they need to do without you being overt, like Officer Johnson, he's exiting the building now. You, know, you don't wanna do that. Um, so other than stationary surveillance, the second kind is moving surveillance, i.e. Uh, you wanna tail somebody. You wanna, you wanna go follow them where they're going and what they're doing. There's three different kinds of that. There's open surveillance, which is where people know they're under surveillance. Like mob bosses, Mob bosses know they're under surveillance. You don't need to hide it. Just, you know, put some, some actual uniformed officers on them to follow them around. They expect to be under surveillance. Um, but most of the time we wanna kinda keep it quiet. We don't want those being surveilled to know they're being surveilled. In that case, there's loose, which is where you kinda risk them, maybe them getting away, but you really don't want them to, to know that you're following them. And there's tight, which is a little riskier. It's a little easier for people to tell they're being followed, um, but they uh, uh, it's much harder for them to get away from the people following them. You can use equipment, right? Um, so I think I misspelled aerial there. That's a different kind of aerial. Um, but what's supposed to what that's supposed to say there? is that you can use helicopters or airplanes or even satellites to surveil people and that does not violate any expectation of privacy. Um, anything you can see from a helicopter from above, you know, you can't come down, I don't know what the exact line limit is, um, but above a certain, you know, a few hundred feet, maybe a thousand feet, uh, you have no reasonable expectation of privacy, helicopter, plane, whatever, they can fly over, cameras, whatever. Um, and that's all perfectly uh, legal. Uh, you can also use video, right? You want surveillance cameras in places. You can, and you can either use visible open cameras, like a lot of places around the world have. They have open, you know, very visible surveillance camera on street corners and on shop, uh, shop walls and all over the place. Or they can be hidden. There are lots and lots of different ways to hide surveillance cameras. You can put a camera in pretty much anything these days. Um, 
one special application of a surveillance camera is license plate recognition. Um, a lot of parking services, but also police departments use these. And basically what they do is they drive around with a camera pointing at where license plates are. And every time the camera sees a license plate, it checks that license plate registration to see if the owner has outstanding parking tickets, outstanding warrants, if they're wanted for something, you know? Um, so that's kind of a, a specialized adaptation of uh, video surveillance. And then of course there's audio surveillance, lots of different ways to do that. There's the classic wiretap, right? Where you can listen in on people's phone calls. Uh, those almost without exception require some kind of warrant. Uh, similarly, there are bugs where these are listening devices that police can plant in a room where they think a crime is going to happen or be discussed or whatever. So um, if they can get a warrant to bug a, a bad guy's hotel room where, you know, a police officer will dress up as the cleaning crew and go in and clean the hotel. But while they're in, they'll, they're, they'll plant a bug somewhere where the person won't see it. And from then on, they can kind of listen in on what's happening in that hotel room. Um, one of the new kind of fancy ways to do audio surveillance um, they found out that any noise happening in a room will cause the windows of that room to vibrate just the tiniest little bit. Because that's what noise is, right? Noise is just vibrating air. And when that vibrating air hits glass, the glass vibrates along with the vibrating air. So they've actually developed the ability to use a laser from pretty far away. Like I, I'm pretty sure you can be like hundreds of feet away. But as long as you can see a window to the room, you can shine a laser at the window to that room and it, the laser reads the vibrations in the glass and translate that back into sound. And you can listen to what's happening in that room, which is pretty cool. Um, there was a court case, USV McKinnon, 93. Basically, two guys get arrested. They both get shoved into the back of a patrol car. And while they think they're alone in the patrol car, they discuss the crime they had just committed and that they had just gotten arrested for. Unbeknownst to them, the police were recording them within the patrol car. Um, and they claimed that that was a violation of their right to, to, to privacy, their right to be, um, you know, the Fourth Amendment rights. Uh, and the Supreme Court says, no, you have no reasonable expectation of privacy in the back of a police patrol car. Uh, one of my favorite or, or one of the most interesting court cases in my eyes uh, was Kilo v. U.S. Because I do a lot of technology work, cybercrime, um, law enforcement use of technology and stuff. That's kind of one of my main interest areas. And uh, in Kilo v. U.S., basically, um, police, I think it was something along the lines of uh, they had uh, uh, information that a certain house or one house on a certain street uh, had an indoor marijuana grow operation. So without a warrant, they used a thermal imaging camera to look at that house or every house on that street or something uh, to see if there was a very bright hot spot in that house. Because indoor marijuana grow operations, they use a lot of lights and those generate a lot of heat. Um, and sure enough, they found that there was one room in this one house that was really glowing really, really hot. They use that as probable cause to acquire a warrant. The Supreme Court says no. Even though you were using this device from a public street where you would normally have the right to be, that doesn't count as plain view because normal people don't use infrared cameras. When you use the infrared camera, you're going above and beyond what a normal person would be able to use as technology for surveillance. Um, so that required a warrant to use that thermal imaging device on that house, you need a warrant. Um, but in that case and other cases, they've kind of carved out exceptions for things that are either less intrusive or more common, like binoculars. Binoculars are very common. Lots of people have binoculars. They're like, not that big a deal. So police uh, can use binoculars to enhance their senses. And that doesn't kind of go beyond the bounds of a reasonable thing uh, that st can still quant qualify as plain view. Uh, automatic license plate readers, uh, courts have ruled fairly consistently that that's not an invasion of privacy, even though it theoretically kind of enhances the senses. 
Um, so anything that, that can't really invade your privacy or is very common with people, you can use that to enhance your senses, um, but not anything that's kind of uncommon or really expensive. If you want to do those, you need a warrant or some other um, exception to the warrant requirement. Um, I'm going to take a break here. See you in the next subsection.